navigation so that the crew could return to Earth in case communication with mission control was lost. Lovell navigated by star sightings using a sextant built into the spacecraft, measuring the angle between a star and the Earth's horizon. This task was made difficult by a large cloud of debris around the spacecraft, which made it hard to distinguish the stars. By seven hours into the mission, the crew was about one hour and forty minutes behind flight plan because of the problems in moving away from the SIVB and Lovell's obscured star sightings. The crew placed the spacecraft into passive thermal control, also called, barbecue roll, in which the spacecraft rotated about once per hour around its long axis to ensure even heat distribution across the surface of the spacecraft. In direct sunlight, parts of the spacecraft's outer surface could be heated to over 200 degrees Celsius, while the parts in shadow would be minus 100 degrees Celsius. These temperatures could cause the heat shield to crack and propellant lines to burst. Because it was impossible to get a perfect roll, the spacecraft swept out a cone as it rotated. The crew had to make minor adjustments every half hour as the cone pattern got larger and larger. NASA had decided at least one crew member should be awake at all times to deal with problems that might arise. The crew had to use the small RCS thrusters to make up the shortfall. He vomited twice and had a bout of diarrhea, this left the spacecraft full of small globules of vomit and feces, which the crew cleaned up as well as they could. The crew decided to use the data storage equipment, which could tape voice recordings and telemetry and dump them to mission control at high speed. Navigation so that the crew could return to Earth in case communication with mission control was lost. Lovell navigated by star sightings using a sextant built into the spacecraft, measuring the angle between a star and the Earth's horizon. This task was made difficult by a large cloud of debris around the spacecraft, which made it hard to distinguish the stars. By seven hours into the mission, the crew was about one hour and forty minutes behind flight plan because of the problems in moving away from the SIVB and Lovell's obscured star sightings. The crew placed the spacecraft into passive thermal control, also called, barbecue roll, in which the spacecraft rotated about once per hour around its long axis to ensure even heat distribution across the surface of the spacecraft. In direct sunlight, parts of the spacecraft's outer surface could be heated to over 200 degrees Celsius, while the parts in shadow would be minus 100 degrees Celsius. These temperatures could cause the heat shield to crack and propellant lines to burst. Because it was impossible to get a perfect roll, the spacecraft swept out a cone as it rotated. The crew had to make minor adjustments every half hour as the cone pattern got larger and larger. NASA had decided at least one crew member should be awake at all times to deal with problems that might arise. The crew had to use the small RCS thrusters to make up the shortfall. He vomited twice and had a bout of diarrhea, this left the spacecraft full of small globules of vomit and feces, which the crew cleaned up as well as they could. The crew decided to use the data storage equipment, which could tape voice recordings and telemetry and dump them to mission control at high speed. The Apollo 8 crew and mission control medical personnel held a conference using an unoccupied second floor control room. Space adaptation syndrome had not occurred on previous spacecraft, because those astronauts could not move freely in the small cabins of those spacecraft. The cruise phase was a relatively uneventful part of the flight, except for the crews checking that the spacecraft was in working order and that they were on course. The Apollo 8 crew used a 2-kilogram camera that broadcast in black and white only, using a Viticon tube. During this first broadcast, the crew gave a tour of the spacecraft and attempted to show how the Earth appeared from space. In the end, all the crew could show the people watching back on Earth was a bright blob. By this time, the crew had completely abandoned the planned sleep shifts. The crew was unable to see the moon for much of the outward cruise. Two factors made the moon almost impossible to see from inside the spacecraft, three of the five windows fogging up due to outgassed oils from the silicone sealant, and the attitude required for passive thermal control. It was not until the crew had gone behind the moon that they would be able to see it for the first time. This time, the crew rigged up filters meant for the still cameras so they could acquire images of the Earth through the telephoto lens. Although difficult to aim, as they had to maneuver the entire spacecraft, the crew was able to broadcast back to Earth the first television pictures of the Earth. The crew spent the transmission describing the Earth, what was visible, and the colors they could see. At about 55 hours and 40 minutes into the flight, and 13 hours before entering lunar orbit, the crew of Apollo 8 became the first humans to enter the gravitational sphere of influence of another celestial body. In other words, the effect of the Moon's gravitational force on Apollo 8 became stronger than that of the Earth. At the time it happened, Apollo 8 was 38,759 miles from the Moon and had a speed of 3,990 feet per second relative to the Moon.
This historic moment was of little interest to the crew, since they were still calculating their trajectory with respect to the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. At exactly 61 hours after launch, about 24,200 miles from the moon, the crew burned the RCS for 11 seconds. At 64 hours into the flight, the crew began to prepare for lunar orbit insertion 1. This maneuver had to be performed perfectly, and due to orbital mechanics had to be on the far side of the moon, out of contact with the Earth. After mission control was pulled for a go, no go, decision, the crew was told at 68 hours that they were go and, riding the best bird we can find. Lovell replied, we'll see you on the other side, and for the first time in history, humans traveled behind the moon and out of radio contact with the Earth. With 10 minutes remaining before LOI-1, the crew began one last check of the spacecraft systems and made sure that every switch was in its correct position. The LOI burn was only two minutes away, so the crew had little time to appreciate the view. Lunar orbit the SPS was ignited at 69 hours, 8 minutes, and 16 seconds after launch and burned for 4 minutes and 7 seconds, placing the Apollo 8 spacecraft in orbit around the moon. The crew described the burn as being the longest 4 minutes of their lives. If it had lasted too long, they could have struck the moon. After making sure the spacecraft was working, they finally had a chance to look at the moon, which they would orbit for the next 20 hours. If the crew had not burned the engine, or the burn had not lasted the planned length of time, the crew would have appeared early from behind the moon. Exactly at the calculated moment the signal was received from the spacecraft, indicating it was in a 193.3 by 69.5 mile orbit around the moon. After reporting on the status of the spacecraft, Lovell gave the first description of what the lunar surface looked like. The moon is essentially gray, no color. Looks like plaster of Paris or sort of a grayish beach sand. One of the crew's major tasks was reconnaissance of planned future landing sites on the moon, especially one in Mare Tranquilitatis that was planned as the Apollo 11 landing site. A film camera had been set up in one of the spacecraft windows to record one frame per second of the moon below. By the end of the mission, the crew had taken over 870 mm still photographs and 700 feet of 16 mm movie film. As they reappeared for their second pass in front of the moon, the crew set up equipment to broadcast a view of the lunar surface. Throughout the next two orbits, the crew continued to check the spacecraft and to observe and photograph the moon. When the spacecraft came out from behind the moon for its fourth pass across the front, the crew witnessed an Earthrise in person for the first time in human history. NASA's Lunar Orbiter 1 had taken the first picture of an Earthrise from the vicinity of the Moon, on August 23, 1966. Earth saw the Earth emerging from behind the lunar horizon and called in excitement to the others, taking a black and white photograph as he did so. Due to the synchronous rotation of the Moon about the Earth, Earthrise is not generally visible from the lunar surface. Earthrise is generally visible only while orbiting the Moon, and at selected surface locations near the Moon's limb, where libration carries the Earth slightly above and below the lunar horizon. Urs continued to take photographs while Lovell assumed control of the spacecraft so that Borman could rest. Despite the difficulty resting in the cramped and noisy spacecraft, Borman was able to sleep for two orbits, awakening periodically to ask questions about their status. Borman awoke fully when he started to hear his fellow crew members make mistakes. Urs initially protested, saying that he was fine, but Borman would not be swayed. Urs finally agreed under the condition that Borman would set up the camera to continue to take automatic pictures of the moon. Borman also remembered that there was a second television broadcast planned, and with so many people expected to be watching, he wanted the crew to be alert. For the next two orbits, Anders and Lovell slept while Borman sat at the helm.